man, when we get this thing working, it is going to be awesome. I want just one button. A little bit of what I'll talk about today is actually the, the screens that I'm playing with are part of, it's very meta, it's about the talk itself. Because this is one part of being able to transform and, and do things with your ASCII doc is to be able to create slideware, training material, that kind of stuff. So we're actually, some of this is a little bit of experimental here of what I'm using because we're trying to get more out of the browser than, than, than it's currently giving us. So, All right, are we ready to go? Okay, let's do it. All right, well, uh, sorry for the delay there. Um, always some uh, kinks to work out at the beginning of the conference. So, uh, but welcome, thank you for coming. Uh, so today we're going to be taking a look at how to write in, in a format called ASCIIDoc and be able to publish everywhere and what, what that means uh, and what possibilities uh, that presents to us. I'm Dan Allen. Um, I'm the, one of the co-owners of Open Device, and uh, one of the things that my company does is help uh, co other companies develop and improve uh, their writing and their content process and also uh, doing d technical documentation and training and um, really all rooting back to uh, being ASCIIDoc based. And rather than kind of explain all of what it is that I do, this talk will essentially give you an idea of what I focus on on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, because this is really what the essence of my company is trying to deliver, is to be able to get you uh, in a position to get more out of your content. And I don't think that we're getting very much out of our content today, so there's a lot of room for improvement. So I, I want to start out with a little bit of anecdotal story here. Um, actually, I just kind of remembered this. I had a memory a couple of days ago, and I think that it answers the question of how did I get involved in publishing, and web publishing, technical publishing. And, you know, it's one of those things where you think a little bit in your life and you, you think, you know, there must have been something really far back in my life that, that a seed was planted, and I'm playing that out now. So this is my story. So when I was young, my uh, parents got us our first computer, and it was an Apple II, and it had a printer as well, the image writer. So this was 1985, 6, pretty, pretty far back. I think you can tell by the screenshot how far back we're going. I mean, when you start to use different colored lines to get uh, contrast uh, in gradients, that, that's, um, that's a sign of where we were then. So one of our favorite programs to use was this, the print shop. Hence uh, the tie-in here. So using this program, we could make uh, signs and banners and greeting cards using an assortment of, and the important thing, fonts, uh, clip art, which of course we're starting to see emerge again today as emoji, and pattern borders. And to be sure, we made a lot of these things. So we would send a job off to the printer uh, once we made our creation, and it would turn that work into something physical. So it would look a lot like this. And uh, back then, if you have to think about it, printing was really the only way uh, that we had to share what we created to make the statement that you wanted to make. People didn't have, you know, screens in their pockets, you know, like we all do. So we would make these flyers, these signs, and we would adorn our, our walls and our, and our doors with them. And one of the favorite statements was, of course, keep out with a skull and crossbones. And I wish I could find it. I, I could not find it. But in this gallery, there's a skull and crossbone in all ASCII, and it was just tremendous. We, it was the, our go-to for any message that we had. Happy birthday, of course, was another, in this particular case, 40 is the new 20, or whatever it is that this says. So uh, that was kind of our version of web publishing. And I remember thinking, we can make this thing say whatever we want. This is really, really exciting. So what do we want to say? You know, and then you get this thought, oh my gosh, I can make something, and now what do I want to say? So it was really my first time experiencing the um, publishing content and the, and the feeling, that amazing feeling that you get when you can put something out into the world, a message or, or a thought, and, and share something with other people to really express yourself and to inform. So I was particularly enthralled by the printing process, which actually comes, um, uh, plays a pretty important role in all of this. So the, this type of printer had a ribbon cartridge, and so in the back of the ribbon, it would get pressed against the paper um, in, you know, in some sort of staccato, and it would make its marks. 
and when you send something to the printer, it would launch in this flurry of activity, so much so that when the thing was moving back and forth, it would shake and move the desk that it was on, right? It's going so quickly. And it's like it was in seemingly some sort of panic to strike each dot on the matrix as fast as possible. And I often wondered, you know, as this thing was printing, you know, whether the printer knew what it was making. Because slowly this image would emerge from the edge of the printer and it's, you could start to see the formation of a letter. Oh, it really is saying happy birthday. The worst, of course, is when you realize that there's a spelling mistake and you're halfway through the banner. So, you know, uh, a little bit more difficult than it is today with a quick web update. So, but the fact that it printed so slowly was actually significant here because it meant that we could only print so many things, and so we kind of had to decide what we really wanted to say because we had to wait some period of time for it to play out. And of course, you know, picture a group of young kids all vying to get their message uh, out into the world. They're huddled behind this screen, barking out commands of what we want to type and what we want to write and send to the printer. So it was not only my first publishing experience, but it was my first collaborative writing experience. You know, everyone's trying to uh, work together to find the right message. So our technical content today um, has a lot to say, but it also serves a lot of different masters, and just as it did in our childhood print shop. So therefore, it's essential for your content, your workflow, to be flexible enough to be able to cater to all those different stakeholders and not give favor to one, and then the, others, the other stakeholders are kind of left out. So the, you know, what is the secret here? And it, it should be no mystery, a, um, a concept that you've heard plenty of times in tech. I'm not the first, I won't be the last to say, separate your content and presentation. We see the same thing in web apps when we separate our model from our view, those types of things, e equally important in content. And this way, you're able to meet the needs of those various stakeholders, but at the same time, anytime we start to manipulate the writing process, there's a very, very important balance that has to be achieved so as not to hinder creation and so as not to hinder collaboration and not to hinder the ability to publish. And this is the balance that I believe ASCIIDoc strikes, which I'll talk to you about today. So when we're putting together a writing system, so we have a group and we need to be able to publish stuff, we, I think that we, think, we need to think about the capabilities of the system. Because when you don't think about the capabilities and the people who are the ones that are, um, you know, th that need those capabilities and the stakeholders, then you end up with a system that was off the shelf promising something and everyone hates it. So what do we have to think about? Well, I think we need to think about three capabilities. Number one is creation, that's the writer. And then publication, that would probably be the developer oftentimes, uh, but also you have to think about the needs of the audiences that you have, what, what formats do they want to consume. And then finally, collaboration. No, none of our technical documentation is written by one person, um, not even, you, you imagine, not even the marketing content or any type of content uh, in the business world, so we have to be thinking about collaboration. So these are the three things that we're gonna, this is the lens that we're gonna evaluate this technology through today and see if it satisfies these pillars. And then we're gonna learn some of the features uh, and capabilities of that system and what we can do to get a little bit more out of it So once we, once we feel like we've decided. So let's start with creation. So all other things aside, in publishing, there's no uh, mystery. The content is king. The words, the message, has to be right or else what's the point of publishing anything? So a content system that does not consider the needs of the person who's creating that content is doomed for failure. So the spotlight of this first section is on the writers. And so writers, this is for you. So before I get into talking about any particular format, I wanna talk about how those writers often feel. And we make them feel this way when they hear words, uh, acronyms like CMS, Content Management System. They, they leave you feeling very confined because they basically give you a text box where you put your content into. And it's not your environment and it's not your, your creative space. So you feel like that's it. And then once you have it in that format, 
you know, you might think about systems like Magnolia or Confluence or whatever, it's kind of where, it, where you wrote it is where it stays. So how do we get it so that we can do more with the content? So again, we feel like all avenues are locked up. So perhaps some of you can attest to this, the struggle, it's real. So let's talk first about just two formats. I want to take a look at DocBook real quick and LaTeX. There are plenty of other formats. I'm just looking at these two formats. This way we have something to contrast it with. So you imagine that you're a writer and you're writing in this XML language DocBook. DocBook is, a, is an XML schema that's highly structured and it's semantic. So that's good, has a nice um, keen focus on separating content and presentation. But then the writer is unleashed, uh, well, the, 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 this is set on their desk and the writer has to start editing and here's what they see. So we look more like we're editing some sort of web service uh, over the wire interchange format. Um, when you look at this snippet, the first thing that pretty much anyone's eye is drawn to is all the XML tags, the, the, the not what we call the non-content, the meta. And it's verbosity, right? This is just a simple little document and it's already going on to two pages. And there's a lot of pomp and circumstance here. So, yeah, clearly made by an engineer for an engineer, not a writer. And it screams, I don't really care about your needs. Why do I have all of these tags? Well, the engineer thought, well, I'm going to need to be able to parse this and I'm going to convert it. So I'm going to give you this schema that you have to write into for me. But what about the writer, right? We really, really leave the writer out. So writers often get this sense that their content is locked up in this structure and they have this burden to remember all of the tags and when they're supposed to use them and what hierarchy the tags are supposed to be in. And oh, by the way, easy for us to think of as engineers, but end tags don't mean a lot to writers often. So when they say, hey, my content doesn't work anymore, you know, our first thought, maybe you're missing an end tag, right? Because we've done enough HTML in our lives to know what happens. But the writer doesn't necessarily know that. And think about their need to put an end XML tag is irrelevant. It's not even what they're thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. They have to think about some other concern. And this is unfortunate. So we'll see why, uh, we'll see why that matters a little bit later on. But what the ironic part about DocBook is, is that... Um, the engineer didn't even do herself a service at all either because parsing XML and working with XML tools and specifically the XSLT tool chain that DocBook is based on is extraordinarily painful. So the engineer really created their own little nightmare for themselves and the writer and nobody's winning. So I like the separation. I like the semantics, but I don't like what we have to pay in order to get into that system. And trust me, my feeling, my personal feeling, my, we could say my, my company's position on this, is that I don't think that using DocBook is a smart engineering investment. I basically tell people, don't do it. Because it's going to cost you 10 to 100 times the amount it should. It's easier to just pick something else. So moving on, I want to look a little bit further back into LaTeX. So there are a lot of formats that were, that were lightweight markup before there was lightweight markup. There's LaTeX and Trough and various other uh, uh, syntaxes within the Unix ecosystem that people used to write. And I don't want to cast them out. I want to include them in the conversation. They're important. So here's what it looks like. Again, a lot of tags, although in this time not XML tags, some sort of special machine code tags. But again, you're still focusing mostly on the bold words, which are all of the delimiters. And the content kind of gets lost in this. What does it say? Could you quickly read this? And again, you have to remember when you're supposed to use all these codes. And it has low-level engineering requirements, like being able to use packages very much like imports in Java. So again, clearly made by an engineer while the writer was away. And it screams, I don't really see the difference between content and presentation and layout, so let's just move to, merge it all together. Extremely powerful tool chain, no doubt, and it's probably the best tool chain to create a print documents like PDF, but at the same time, not so good for the writer. So I kind of think of it as like writers, the content is sort of locked up into a bird's nest. And it, it's funny, I came across this picture, it's funny. What would happen if you gave a bowerbird a bunch of trash? Well, they would 
make pretty good use of it. So you, you, you have the situation where you have just kind of a garbage pile, even though it's very organized uh, semantically, it still looks like a garbage pile. So it kind of, you lose something by having all these tags all over the place. Uh, and it's just hard to imagine something that's less welcoming. The other major problem with a format like LaTeX is that it wasn't designed with multi-channel web publishing in mind. If you aren't thinking about the web today, you're, that, that's not a good content solution because it's not going to work. 90%, you know, most of the output formats are just variations of web. It's mobile. It's desktop. It's, uh, you know, embedded uh, HTML regions in other tools, et cetera. So really, it's just different flavors of HTML, CSS, et cetera because they're so powerful. So we want to be able to use them. You have a format that wasn't designed with that in mind, you're always going to have a problem. So again, all of these writing systems really catering to some specific need of the engineer and the writer kind of gets left out. So let's pull that writer back in and make her the dignitary. Let's, let's get her needs, figure out what she needs to be able to write. So after getting to know her needs, we create something, let's say, called ASCII doc. And here's the markup we present her. Exact same document I've been showing you now in ASCII doc. Now we see the content is the primary concern and the metadata is sort of in the background. Yummy, right? <laughs> so somewhere in the distance I can hear the writer singing. I can see clearly now all the tags are gone. So let's look at some of the aspects that make ASCII doc interesting. Well, first of all, it's clear and concise. The, uh, the writer, Antoine de saint Expiry, 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 the little prince, right, author, said, you know, the measure of perfection is not when there's something more to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. Now, ASCII doc is far from perfect, but it starts to get into that philosophy where we've tried to take away anything that really was not necessary and, and imply things. So we'll look at how we are able to do that. Probably the most interesting are paragraph or paragraph. This is understanding the, the nature of writing. If you realize that most writing is just paragraphs, you know, you look at any web page, any technical manual, you know, most of the content are just paragraphs. So let's, let's start with paragraphs and go outwards from there, right? So if we think about everything as paragraphs, then all of a sudden we know that that's the, the main case is the simplest case, right? That's the way to go. Familiar convention. So, um, so ASCII doc builds on the conventions that we may intuitively use. So for instance, for as long as we've been writing, people have created lists. And the way that they create lists is they put a little asterisk and they write the item. Let's build on that. So that's the idea of taking conventions and using them. What would you have done if I didn't tell you about this format? Whatever you would have naturally done, let's, let's build on that. And so we see a lot of that in ASCII doc. There's also common terminology. So um, I, don't, I, don't, I wish I had an example up here, but basically, if you were to create an image, or you were to create a link, or you were to create a video, the easiest way for people to remember what those things are is to use the word image, to use the word video, and to use the word link, right? Because that's what it is. So if I were to give you a, a special markup where I say, well, two explanation points followed by a URL is an image, that's not intuitive. But if I said it's image, followed by the URL, okay, that's something you can remember. And if you know image, then you know video, and you know audio, and you know other things, because the subject clearly states what it is. So those are the types of, to, 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 to draw from common terminology is extremely powerful. Um, we have to always remember that we, there was, um, there's a famous uh, phrase that we have monkey brains. And a lot of technology is catering to the monkey brains that we have. We can't change our brains. That's the way the brain works. So what we do is we develop apps, we develop technology that kind of just goes with the flow of things. That's what, what I'm talking about here. Now, I mentioned about the missing an end tag. Forgiving syntax, I think, is a crucial requirement for writers. If, if they get it wrong, it should do something at least sensible. Yes, it may not look exactly the way they wanted, but at least they can keep writing and kind of fix it later. If you miss an end tag and you say, stop the boat, everyone get off, there's a missing end tag somewhere. 
that's just not going to be good for productivity. Going back to that idea of the, the monkey brains, we tend to remember patterns very well. We're, we're, our brains are essentially pattern recognition machines. So if we have, if we develop a language that's based on patterns, then humans will naturally go, I see the pattern in this and I will follow it. So the more that we can build on patterns, the more we don't even have to teach about this. And then finally, kind of circling back to the top of DocBook, ASCII-Doc is semantic. As a matter of fact, ASCII-Doc was developed as a shorthand for DocBook. This is a good thing because it has none of the problems that DocBook has in terms of uh, invasiveness to the writer, but it still understands the spirit of having semantic writing. And so this actually is very appealing to teams that have been on DocBook and they're coming over to ASCII-Doc and of course they have their thousands of tags that they're worried about trying to map and ASCII-Doc has the ability to give you those semantics if you want them. You can kind of take as much as you want. So the, the most powerful of and, and probably the most pragmatic aspect of ASCII-Doc for developing those semantics are what we call roles. And I give three examples here. Um, at the very top, we see that we have some sort of path. Now, you imagine somewhere in your technical documentation, you, have a, you, you need to tell someone a path, and you may want to present that in a certain way in monospace text, in italic text, however you want. As a writer, you don't want to worry about that. What you want to do is you want to notify the system, sort of notify the people downstream, that there's something significant about this and that it plays a certain role. And it gets you out of the business of having to worry about how it looks. You don't worry about how it looks. You just mark it and move on. You can come up with your own roles. I'll talk a little bit later on about how uh, teams can kind of come up with their own, um, you know, in-house dialects, if you will, that, are, that, that form these roles. But what I like about this is it's a schemaless system. So the number of roles that you can choose from, the number of roles that you can think of. What other system has something like this? So we can think about HTML, right? HTML, we can give a CSS class to just about any element. What are the names of the CSS classes you're allowed to use? Whatever you want. So we have the same mapping here, but notice no HTML, right? No XML, none of that. We just capture the, the concept. And you can then apply this. Remember I mentioned about repeatable patterns. You can stamp this across all aspects. So it's section titles, which is the second example. You can just say, hey, this is a topic. I don't know what you want to do with it yet, but it seems significant. This is a topic. Okay, move on. And then we can do things like, in the third example is a sidebar. We can say, oh, this is some sort of cue. This is, this is an aside, but it's a specific type of an aside. Maybe it's collapsible, right? We can give it those little hints, and then the developer downstream can do all kinds of amazing stuff, which we're going to get into in a bit. So w when you think of ASCII Doc, and, you, and someone's like, well, what's so great about ASCII Doc? I would say, Bring up fairly early on the idea of roles. It's such an important and powerful concept. And it's some of what is allowing me to do what I'm doing here with the presentation. The other aspect of ASCII-Doc that I recognized sort of year, sort, some years after using it for a while and realizing what was so powerful about it is that it happens to be in a left-aligned, line-oriented syntax. So why, why does that matter? Well, imagine you've been using um, how many of you have used uh, and written in Markdown? I'm mean, pretty sure all of us have done that, right? So you're, you're, you're creating a list, and you want to put a code sn snippet in that list. How many times do you have to hit the space bar in order to make that thing a code snippet, right? So you start to get content that's floating out into the ether because it needs this heavy in indentation, and the indentation is very contextual, and you have to remember all these rules. So being able to root everything to the left is actually significant. Now, the only way that we can do that is we have to tie into another aspect of the plain text, which is the fact that it's lines. Where else do we use lines for statements, right, in code? The semicolons, in a way, were a relic of the past before we kind of all agreed that we would put statements on lines. Because we would imagine that if we consolidate all the code, how would you separate it out? Well, why not use the line? So we use it. So when we do that, we know that that line goes together and it must mean something. And we can do a lot of things with line-oriented to help with the nest, to, to remove the need for nested context. So actually, I want to, um, I'm just going to open up 
uh, G-Edit here, here real quick, because I just want to show an example of what I'm talking about. Oh, we got to drop out of the full screen here. There we go. So, um, let's just make that bigger. Okay. So, we're, we're writing along here, and um, we say, I want to create some sort of a special block. And this happens to be a sidebar block. So I can type in here and I can say this is an aside. Okay? And then I want to say, you know, here's the code you need to know. And you might think in some languages I would have to do all this spacing. But again, because it's, because it's left aligned, we already know that we're inside of a sidebar block by these fences. So what we can do is we can just put a different set of fences, and now we can say, now we have, we have code. And this actually simplifies things a lot, and I think that there's a lot that the tooling can do to help you know, for instance, I'm just in gedit right now, but you can imagine a tool if I were highlighting on this, just like in my uh, editor, it might highlight line six as well as line eight, so it knows this is, uh, this is a, a block. Um, and it also makes it so that we can get into doing things like uh, not having to um, wrap lines because we're not losing so much space at the beginning of the line because of indentation. So it's a little bit of a departure from some of the programming languages but I think it taps into this idea of um, uh, what, what I'm going to um, sort of, fo uh, I'm blanking out on the name of the language, um, uh, the f one of the first object-oriented languages, why am I forgetting what it is, small talk, thank you. The idea in Smalltalk was that you would, you would focus just on the bit of code you were writing and all the other code would go away, right? It would just fade away or, or not be shown. And so what this allows us to do is if we're working within this sidebar block, I can kind of forget that I'm in a sidebar block and just think I'm working on top level content, right? So now we're, we're not having to, uh, you know, feel like we're deeply nested. We can be focused. So I think that there are some aspects uh, of this that kind of take from that spirit of things. Okay, let's see if I can figure out how to... Yeah, get back. There we go. Uh oh. I'm going to control it from here. There we go. Yes. All right. So, what isn't here? We're in the text editor, right? We're not looking at any previews yet. So we don't have WYSIWYG. Well, I, I hate to break it to you, but you already know this. WYSIWYG should really be renamed, you get what you get. <laughs> YGWYG. Because it really puts a barrier between you and your content. When you click on a button, it's gonna decide exactly how it's gonna bold that thing. It's gonna decide what's going to happen when you hit return, and you kind of don't know what's going on under the covers. And when you look at the source, then you realize you kind of get what you pay for, right? You have a lot of BRs or just breaks, and depending on how many times you hit enter and delete, and, you know, what happens when you hit unbold on the, I always wonder, you know, what happens when you hit unbold on a region or bold on a different re, different span, do you get nested bolds or does it know to actually remove the bolds so we're there? You really start to get uh, a leaky abstraction. So what I want to advocate for, and I, and I am helping to progress, is this idea of an IDE for writers. What if instead of thinking about always that writers are these people that you know, can't think and need the preview to be the thing that they're typing into, like a Word document, what if instead we gave them all the tools that we're familiar with as, as uh, developers and allow them to benefit from those same efficiencies? So things like refactoring or content assist uh, or outlines and so on and so forth. 
what if those were the tools we gave them instead of keeping giving them WYSIWYG? Because the problem with WYSIWYG gets them thinking about how it's going to be presented, which is the wrong thought. It's kind of like thinking when you're writing the Java code, uh, uh, sorry, when you're writing, um, like let's say an Android IDE, and you're tr trying to drag and drop stuff around the user interface in your little preview window, and hoping that that's how it's going to look when it's deployed to all these different phones. It's better to learn how the, uh, the user interface language is uh, b becoming an expert in the user interface language and describing what you want and then allowing that to be interpreted. So it's very similar. So I want to give you just a, there's three tools I want to mention real quick to go check out afterwards if you haven't yet already. Um, Atom, ASCII.FX, and IntelliJ. So this is Atom. Atom is a general purpose uh, text editor that has the ability to have add-ons. One of those add-ons is uh, a suite of tools for ASCII.Doc. You know, I've talked already about, we spent a lot, you know, we spent a lot of time talking already about the source view on the left-hand side. But what if you want to have a preview? Well, you don't have to go all the way to WYSIWYG to have a preview. There's, just like you might have in a split pane uh, for doing HTML editing in, a, in an IDE, we can give you a relatively reasonable preview of what it is that you're typing so that you get a picture in your head. And after a while, I think you start to imagine the way it looks and you don't ne necessarily need that preview. Um, another reason that you might want the preview is just because you want to kind of be in reading mode as opposed to in editor mode. You don't want to see all the comments and all the, the metadata. You just want to see the text as it would be presented so that you get an idea of what you're sending to the writer. But again, this is just a, one interpretation of that. So it's not necessarily that all publishing is going to look like the content on the right. But it is useful. Now, I'll point out a couple of interesting things about the Atom editor. Um, one is it gives you syntax highlighting for ASCII doc. And actually this was developed over in the last six months and it's very, it's very accurate. So it's probably one of the best, it's the, probably one of the most accurate syntax highlightings for ASCII doc that exists. And the reason this is uh, important is because just like when in our IDE, when we see that it, we typed the keyword correctly, it gives us a little bit of feedback loop there, maybe by changing the color, giving us some sort of acknowledgement that you got it, right? So this can be important for the writer who's trying to learn ASCII doc. And for instance, let's say, let's take this admonition block that is a note. And they type the word note. I've seen ASCII doc documents where people will type something like tip, uh, sorry, um, uh, what is it, info. Info is not a recognized keyword in ASCII doc. So they would know, hey, it didn't turn blue. I must have it wrong. So that's important to prevent errors down the road, down the line. The other thing that it has that's quite interesting is that, and this is a feature built into Atom itself, it has the ability to syntax highlight languages that are embedded within the ASCII doc document in that native language. So in this case, it's syntax highlighting the Atom, uh, the YAML. So those are, those are nice little, um, uh, ni ni nice little features to have when you're writing. Um, you kind of get used to, by the way, not looking at a completely stark black and white rendering of the ASCII doc text too, and you start to kind of like the contrast that the bolds and the italics give you, and of course that's themable. So um, I don't have the, uh, the, the screenshot here, but uh, there are two other editors that are interesting are ASCII doc effects and IntelliJ has a plugin for ASCII doc. And what I think is most interesting so far about those tools is the outline view. So the outline view in the left hand side, just like we would have in our source code, it would tell us about classes and methods and things like that. Here we have a, there's an inherent structure. We have section titles, uh, we have you know, blocks and we have nested blocks. We might have uh, another a view that gives us all the listing blocks, you know, all the source code examples, and we can click on it and jump right to it. So there's, there's a navigation element to it as well. And then the thing that both IntelliJ and uh, ASCII doc effects have is sync scroll. Now that's not in the Atom editor. So if I were to scroll on the left-hand side, the, the right-hand side would stay in sync with my source. So that the, because on a long document, I can get way out and then I'm constantly having to move scroll bars around. So, and being able to click on a heading like if I came over here and clicked on manual installation, then it would jump to manual installation here. So I can either have sync scroll or I can have um, uh, click to sync, that kind of thing. So 
we're familiar with these types of tools and it's interesting to see them coming into the writing world. So I want to wrap up the section on creation on the writer and talk a little bit about some of the recommended practices uh, for ASCII doc. Because if I were to go through all of the syntax of ASCII doc, that would be overwhelming. Uh, there are really great resources on the web like the uh, ASCII doctor user manual and also there's a blog series called Awesome ASCII Doctor which just has awesome tips. To, you know, it's a good way just to get, um, get a toe in the door of what ASCII doc has to offer. So I'm not going through all of the, the syntax, but what I want to do is kind of draw your attention to some of the things you might want to look for and expect out of ASCII doc for the creation process uh, that I haven't mentioned already. So I mentioned earlier this idea of dialect. So when you write in a team, you're going to start to develop some common patterns within the, the doc. So for instance, if you have um, properties in your in your software that you have to document. There may be a way that you write properties and their descriptions and their default values so that every time you have to document some sort of properties with values and et cetera, someone isn't, and not each person in the team is making up their own way of doing it and then you have four different ways of presenting properties in your documentation. So you wanna create these pattern libraries. Um, are you doing this and then create, set that up? So it's a little bit higher level than a style guide uh, it's, it's kind of like uh, in-house conventions. And there may be roles that you have. So whenever you have a path, uh, a file system path somewhere in your documentation, you're supposed to mark it in a special way. And it's very easy to do that at the time that you wrote it rather than go back and try to change a thousand references later, right? And there may be a reason that you need to do that. Um, so you develop these what I call in-house dialects. And there's ASCII doc encourages that. I mean, one, uh, someone mentioned recently, you know, something like GitHub flavored ASCII doc or something like that, or we've, we're used to GitHub flavored markdown. Um, that is, you know, that, that's implying that I'm somehow changing the language. This is different than that. These are, these are in-house flavors of your documentation. This we do encourage. We, this is part of the system, not working against it. Um, and I also recommend setting up whole document templates. So for instance, you need to create a new article uh, in your documentation or you need to create a new um, <coughs> release notes, for instance. Don't create it from scratch because there's a lot of uh, boilerplate you have to go through. Create a template that says release notes template, you know, this is the headings that we use, fill in these blanks and maybe have a short description of what goes in each section. That way the writer picks it up and they just start writing. Because that's what we're trying to get to, is the point where we're not having the writer do all this extra work, we're just having them fill in the blanks, right? Just like what they're trying to sell you with CMS is by typing into these boxes, we can achieve the, the, the goal there, but without sacrificing all of the things, uh, our ability to publish to multiple channels and be able to convert and all that. Um, the, other way, the other main way to uh, Simplify creation is to partition the content. So, let's see if I can switch. Okay, yes, I love it. Okay, so anytime you're typing along and you say, you know, um, just especially when you hear these words, just copy and paste this into your editor. Okay. Those are, should be keywords, and you say, oh, this is some Java code that you're supposed to put in here. Oops, let's do something like that, right? And we say, oh, and then we ask ourselves, is this tested? How many times you copy and paste from the documentation, put it in, it doesn't work, right? So what can we do here? Well, the source code really should not be in the documentation for a couple of reasons. Number one, is it tested? Good question. Probably not. Number two is, uh, when, was, um, when did the writer become the expert in the programming, right? So how are they, why are they managing content that is programming code in their writing? So now you've put the wrong person in charge. So this is the secret, include. So ASCII doc has the ability to partition content. So you include, so what you say is examples, and then we might say, you know, bootstrap, right? And so now, 
it's just going to import that. And again, the, the, potentially the IDE for the writers could, you know, you could do control click and jump to that file, et cetera. So we can have some features. We could even have it so that in the preview window, right, it shows the expanded source code. So we don't lose that, but we don't want the source code to be in the writing, you know, in, in, the, um, in the draft. Now, there are some other things that we can do. We can also take portions of it. So let's just say we want to take tag equals um, the init method. So we can just say take the init method and we can bring that in. Now, right now, that's done using manually tagged regions. In the future, I would like to be able to see a structured includer so it can actually go and take a structural component from that particular language. Java would be very uh, easy to do this with. But suffice to say, we can, we can improve on that, and that happens to be an extension point in Java, so, or in ASCII Doc, so there's a lot you can do. But the include method is very powerful. The other way that the include method is useful is, you know, you get these monolithic documents, this huge readme. I mean, in general, readmes are having problems in that they're not really readmes anymore. They're more, this is the manual, I just called it the readme. But, you know, you can do things like include chapter one, include chapter two, and now I can keep chapter one, chapter two as separate chapters. Within chapter one, I could have section one, section two, et cetera, as separate documents, and then I just compose it. This becomes interesting later on as well because if we're including fragments, that means that we can include different fragments for different documents, and we can have common content. So for instance, at the very top, I might say, um, this, you know, this is how we describe our product, hmm, probably not something I just want to type right here, right? There's a very specific way we describe our product. So I say product description. And maybe that's owned by marketing. So we start to get this idea of roles and responsibilities. Who owns that document? And I can include it, and I can even include it from a URL, another Git repository, et cetera. So includes are extremely powerful for all kinds of things. Uh, within the ASCII doc ecosystem. So use those to their full extent. And the last thing that I'll mention, so and once we start to split things up, we have to, we have to think about things like references. What if chapter one needs to reference chapter two, chapter two to, to, to chapter one? So there are references just like in LaTeX and, and in DocBook where we can refer back to other sections and then you get a link and jump. So those are some of the, the, the recommended best practices. You know, you want to keep your content dry and you want to make sure that the content is just, it, each, each of the snippets of content are in the workspace of the owner. So use includes, make sure that you're not putting the source code directly into the document and so on and so forth. It's easy in the beginning not to do that. I mean, you're just, you sit down, you just write from top to, to end. So this may be a refactoring step. You might do that, and then you start splitting it up. But don't be afraid to split those things up. So it's very important. So we've just talked a lot about the source, and that's the domain of the writer. Now uh, we have all this content in ASCII doc. What can you do with it? So the ASCII doc syntax is simple and elegant, and it's easy to be deceived that all it can create is that preview window that we saw earlier, um, just one rendition of it. But you couldn't be more mistaken because ASCII doc is just the raw material. It's the semantic seeds. And what we want to look at is starting to shed some light on what it could become. What could we do to transform it and where can we publish it? And in the end, it's that it gets me back to that feeling I had in print shop. It's like, what can we do now that we have this tool in our hands? What's the power? So the focus of this section is on the, on the engineer, essentially, the, and, and on the processor and the publisher. So engineers is for you. So before I start the section, I just mentioned there are two words I'm using here, ASCII doc and ASCII doctor. ASCII doc is the syntax. That's what we've been looking at so far. But in a sense, that's just the database of information. What can we do with that brings us to what is going to process it. That's what ASCII doctor is. It's the parser, and it's all the tools that we can use to process that. So... I want to start by mentioning that out of the box, ASCII Doctor converts to a bunch of different 
uh, formats. It can convert to HTML, that's kind of the most standard. It's just the quickest way to get a preview, and it's obviously very ubiquitous. Um, and then it can also do DocBook, because as I mentioned, ASCII Doc was actually created with DocBook in mind. But there's nothing stopping you from interpreting the source in a different way, and even creating different HTML. The HTML that's created is not the HTML that you're stuck with. And that's really what this separation of content and presentation affords you, is that there's, there is not a direct mapping one-to-one -one between ASCII Doc and a known HTML. Every bit of ASCII Doc, um, every bit of output is generated by this tool chain by the, by the converters. So what you want to do, again, you look at the ASCII Doc source as a source of record and not a textual representation of what the output is going to be. Even so much so that it's not necessarily that you have to interpret it in a linear fashion. You don't have to read it from top to bottom in the parser. You can mix things up. So you can create other formats like PDF. I've been working pretty heavily on the PDF converter lately, and I, I think it's interesting because PDF presents a different set of assumptions than HTML does, and it tells me how good the processor is based on whether I can cater to a page-oriented format as opposed to uh, a flow format like HTML. Um, create e EPUB 3, and it keep, even create slides. Like All these slides are actually from an ASCII doc document, and whatever you want. So I'll give you an example of some of the things that you can do uh, by getting control over the parser and, and tapping into some of the extensions. I often get asked, does ASCII Doc have the ability to do a tabbed base interface? And uh, let's see if I just bring up real quick so that you can see what I'm talking about. An example. Because I think that this is something that kind of gets people... Um, kind of opens your mind to, to what is possible just by seeing a, you know, a simple example goes a long way. And of course, my luck, I couldn't remember which page. Uh, there's lots of pages that have this as an example. I know, I know one of them. Um, sorry. Should have had that up. Yes, this this is the page. Uh. My luck is every page I click. I'm looking through. I've, uh, we're working with the uh, MuleSoft documentation, and they use this in their source code. And uh, I was bringing up one of their tutorials. Here it is. Okay. Sorry, I, my luck. But anyway, um, docs.mulesoft.com, they have several examples of, of this particular thing that I'm showing. But anyway, it shows a tab-based interface where they're showing how the visual editor looks and then how the XML editor looks within their IDE. So they're showing you two different tabs and, and showing you um, and describing each of the views that you see. So we can create... Um, introduce a new component into ASCII Doc that ASCII Doc doesn't necessarily know about. We build on the existing structure that's already there within ASCII Doc. Um, in this particular case, we're using the example block. Uh, there are different types of blocks that you can use. Uh, I, I felt like that was the closest semantic mapping for this. And I can annotate the overall container and then each tab. Now, by default, it's just going to show nested example blocks because it doesn't know about tabs. I can put uh, an extension in there that before it converts it, it transforms uh, those into specific HTML that then gets styled as tabs. 
So I have the ability to create components like a tabbed interface, even though it wasn't originally part of ASCII doc. And this can be done for quite a number of components. And the way that's done is by transforming the abstract syntax tree. So ASCII doc gets parsed into an abstract syntax tree, and before it gets converted, I can move nodes around, I can manipulate them, and so on and so forth. One other example is uh, a, a way to extend it is that you can create new block macros. So these are kind of like functions where we have the name and then some sort of parameter and then uh, some open schema of, of attributes. In this particular case, uh, I'm going to say how many sentences I create. So I have the purpose, the lorem epsom generator, uh, the, the method, which is sentences, and then I want to generate five sentences. And then I can just add an, uh, an ASCII doctor extension in and say, I'm going to inform you about this new type of macro, and then you can pull in, and so what you get to do is you get to tap into the parsing process, and you actually get, this gets called as it's parsing. So I don't, I don't know about this macro, I recognize the macro, what is it? It calls your uh, extension, and then you can create new nodes within the system. In, in this particular case, if you look inside the if statement, I create a paragraph, and I throw generated content into it. Okay, so now it get, that block macro gets replaced with lorem epsom text. The other thing that you can do is you can actually weave um, scribed content with generated content. So let's say, for instance, I'm documenting an API. I may have a lot of tables and, and descriptions of the API methods that is generated ASCII doc, and then I have a description about how the API is used and uh, some background and I can weave those together using the include mechanism. I can create ASCII doc, and then I can send it through the generator. So it doesn't necessarily mean that everything that's all literal one-to-one -one of what you've written. So Scott Chacoon, uh, the author of ProGet, I think summed it up perfectly. He said, I can do truly amazing things with my ASCII doc source, and that's what I want you to, to think, is that there are a lot of things that you can do. The, uh, it doesn't all stop at the processor, though. I think that the really interesting part of publication is being able to have a truly automated pipeline, just like we have with continuous deployment for code, we want to have continuous publishing. So what you want to be able to do is set up a pipeline where when you push the content to Git, what the computer takes over from there, runs the processor, aggregates all the assets together, builds out a whole website or, or whatever it is that you're, you're publishing, your download files, et cetera, and pushes them all onto the server where they can be accessed. This is a, it's obviously good for the writer because the writer knows that they just push into the repository and everything happens from there, uh, but it also allows it to be reproducible. Everyone can run that tool chain, that pipeline, and get the same output. And we were just working with a client recently where we, we started with them and they had no build system and there was all these complex commands that everyone had to know how to type and these funny little scripts that they had in order to get some preview or copy all their files over to their Apache server, that's crazy. We can set up an automated pipeline and we can get it so that you don't think about how the, all that is done. So you get that sense that you can truly just push your content into all sorts of different channels. Um, now, I've talked already about a lot, a, a lot of the publication best practices. One of the key things, though, that you can do in your publication is to really cater um, to the collaboration. And so, so automated tools help with this, right? Because uh, instead of the writers uh, and the engineers having to worry about how everyone is calling each other's tools, we put them onto a system where the system kind of manages it for it. So that's where we're going to get into collaboration is, um, so this, this now brings the writers and the engineers together and anyone else involved in the, in the content effort. Um, ASCII Duck is ripe for collaboration because it's version control friendly. And I think that a lot of the collaboration stems from being able to use version control and the tools that are around it. Because they're already there. They're already working great for engineers. So can we just use it? And the fact that we don't have binary blobs and it's just plain text allows us to do things like history and source diffs and rich diffs and branching and merging and all those types of things. And then of just being able to use, in the general sense, the GitHub and the GitLab uh, interfaces. So one, uh, several teams at Red Hat have been migrating from DocBook to ASCII Doc. And I think that they're, um, 
their testimonial is actually quite interesting. What they had reported was that after migrating to, from DocBook to ASCIIDoc, the rate of both the internal and external contributions went from several a year to several a week, right? That's a pretty significant increase. And mere days after the migration that the JBoss BXMS team did, even without really announcing that they had done this, they already started to see incoming pull requests, merge requests, whatever you call them, uh, where there were none before. So no one was feeling like they had the power to be part of the process, and yet now here they are observing that perhaps this is some sort of trend. And I think that that is really about tapping into the, the powerful force that is GitHub already. So we already know GitHub encourages that system encourages a lot of contributions we see it in code, so we should expect that if we put anything there, we should see some results if it plays well with the system. So this is how you know you've made the right choice, because people like it. And that's probably the number one sentiment about content systems, is that people really have a lot of discontent with them. So to have the opposite, not just people, I'm okay with it, but they really like it, that's a step forward. And I think that the driving force behind those contributions is this single link called edit on GitHub. And you see this on a lot of docs now. You're looking at the doc and you're invited to be able to know how you could change the doc. We kind of understand that with source code, that obviously the source code must be stored somewhere, but it's not always obvious to the reader that the content that generated the page that they're looking at is something that they're invited to help modify. But oftentimes, those many eyes and those many minds can see the mistakes. So if you offer them the ability to edit it, and if you do that at a fine, fine grain level, they'll do it. And the fact that, that um, ASCIIDoc works really nicely on GitHub, and it even offers you um, an editor and to be able to type and make changes and send a pull request directly from the web browser without even having to clone the repository, leads to a lot of contributions. And I get a lot of contributions into just the ASCIIDoc projects where people will fix typos within sentences. I'm not saying that that's what most of the contributions, uh, most of the contributors should be doing is just fixing typos, but the point is why not someone just fix something that's so easy for them to do, it only took them five minutes. But we start to get this idea that docs are code, and we treat docs as code and give, give it the same, um, uh, we, we treat it with the same respect, if you will, as code. And so when we do that, we get to start to see things like this. So, and the MuleSoft, as I mentioned, MuleSoft does all their documentation in ASCII doc. You know, you can go through, and oftentimes, as a manager, as a person who's trying to work with the content workflow, they say, what changed recently? Maybe because a change was made that was wrong, maybe because they just want to know if activity's being done, people are doing their tasks. We can just go in there, and boom, out of the box, without even me selling you a content system, you get things like history. And you can dive into one of those entries and you can actually see within the GitHub interface like the sentence that changed. Obviously we're used to seeing this for code, but you know, it works just as well for content. And one of the nice features of GitHub is it actually has the ability to look at it both from a source perspective and with a, you know, with a reasonable preview of what it is, uh, how it's rendered and how it changes then. And so you might see a code snippet um, you know, being modified or a sentence, you know, being modified or an entry added to a bulleted list. It's, we get an idea of where, wh what that change um, affected. And so this is a great way to start to get into code review because we can start to look at those lines and say, hey, actually this sentence isn't quite right. So we have code review tools. We got all this stuff for free. And this is what you get by moving to the, this type of system. So finally, I want to talk about some of the recommended practices that could encourage this. So I've said already ASCII docs naturally friendly for version control systems, but there are things that can make it even more friendly. Uh, one of those is this technique that I call sentence per line. Now I do a talk, I did it last year at DevOps, so it's available on YouTube called how to, um, Writing Fluently, uh, see, uh, How to Hack Your Brain to Write Fluently. And one of the main focuses of that talk is the explanation of what this sentence per line style is. But, but in a nutshell, it, re, it isolates the changes. So if I were to change source code, and imagine XML for a second. If I'm editing XML, and I reformat the XML and make a change, you would kill me. Because you couldn't see the forest from the trees at that point, right? The signal from the noise, it's lost. When you do things like hard wrapping, you, if you change the first 
word in a paragraph and then you reflow the whole paragraph, it looks like you changed every line in the paragraph when you added one word. Sentence per line isolates every change to just the sentence that it affected because every sentence gets its own line. So that is the scope of the change and you could even go more fine grain if you were using things like phrases or semicolons. So there are, there are techniques that you can do to make get not freak out so much uh, about, over some sort of change. And another thing that helps with this, uh, I mentioned before, the includes, by being able to um, have includes in separate files when there's a change made to source code, it doesn't change the content document because it wasn't about the content document, it was the source code that changed. So I don't get an unnecessary change, the writer thinking, oh, I need to review the change because it came in on my document that I'm managing, except actually it wasn't about the document at all, it was about the source code example, and then the engineer should have been looking at it. So again, we have, we know, you get the cue of whose role and responsibility is to be looking at that change. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is about structuring the, the, the repositories themselves. You know, just like we have release lines in software, we want to have release lines in the documentation. So we may have our documentation versioned like the product it's documenting. Uh, that kind of lends itself to a natural um, branching model. We may have a different way of doing it. We may just have version one, version two, version three, and so on and so forth. You want to use branches to keep the different versions. I've seen some teams where they'll just use different folders for all the versions. Okay? And this would be like putting all the versions of your software right in one tree, no branches, and everything's there. And it becomes extraordinarily complicated to figure out, to, you know, to grep for changes, to build out just some section of the site, uh, to, uh, you know, to be able to do some sort of comparison, to migrate changes from one branch to another, because instead you're copying files from one directory to another and there's no natural way of doing diffs. So that, um, you definitely want to look at doing that type of model. There's a, there's a tool called ASCII Binder, which is a wrapper around ASCII Doctor that does this for you. Basically sets up a project and it creates a branching model for you and you, you can just start writing and it already has a way of looping through all the branches and building out each version of the documentation per branch. So I think that there will be more, more tools that will emerge like ASCII Binder that will be... Um, at a higher level than just the processor itself, but will understand the whole um, history of the site and may be able to do contextual searching and things like that. So definitely want to use that model. Um, and then finally, I'll just re-emphasize something in collaboration that's important for publication is that it's so critical that you have an automated build that does everything for you once writing is done. And in that automated build, you're able to add a bunch of things like validations. So you could block changes from going because this document didn't validate. And it doesn't even necessarily mean that the syntax is right. You could have things like prose validation where you're using words that you shouldn't be using. Uh, you might have sentences which are too long, examples which are too large, etc. You could define your own rules. But you want to pump it through an automated system for the same reason that we have for code. You want QA you want uh, reproducibility, and you want reliability. And if you're doing stuff manually, you're gonna get yourself into hot water pretty quickly because it, you know, it just so happens that we have a good way of uh, working ourselves out of efficiency with content by producing a bigger headache than we had originally. And I think that automation tools help keep that under control. So again, we looked at ASCII Doc today in, in, through the lens of three capabilities in creation and the audiences that they serve, creation, publication, and collaboration. And I feel like it hits um, a really nice blend of these. And you know, I encourage you to, to look at ASCII Doc, but not just with, at the syntax, but at the possibilities that you have that I mentioned today. One, that it is very easy to write, but it's extensible and it, it caters well to collaboration. And I think that if you're not hitting all of those elements, then in a way you're, you're gonna run out of, um, you're gonna run out of runway at some point because you'll have overrun the capabilities of the system. So uh, while we're pushing on the one hand to take anything away that do, it is unnecessary, we also wanna give the engineers all the power that they can to transform it and create things like 
as I showed you know as I showed you here to be able to create new ideas that had never been um, conceived before, such as creating slides from a text document uh, in ASCII doc when ASCII doc wasn't originally designed to do something. It wasn't originally anticipated that it would do something, but it was, certainly was designed to be able to do something like that. So I encourage you to, to write and explore ASCII doc and, and publish everywhere. Thank you. And I'll stick around for a few minutes if you have some questions, um, but don't be afraid to run out if you want to go get some snacks. Yeah. What's the easiest way to migrate from Docbook to Eskidoc? Um, I'm glad you mentioned that. So there is a, I, I wrote a converter called Docbook RX, okay. and it does a pretty reasonable job, and the team that I had quoted, uh, the JBoss mm -hmm. JMX team, that's what they were using. They were using specifically that tool. Okay. And they've actually enhanced it uh, a little bit as well. Because DocBook is arbitrarily complex, meaning you can combine tags in almost infinite number of ways, the, there's some tweaking that needs to be done if you use you know, your own sort of combination of things, but it hits most of the standard stuff uh, like say 90% of it just right out of the box and it's pretty easy to hack on but check that out docbook rx